Chapter 17 of The Night Side of Nature, or Ghosts and Ghost Seers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Night Side of Nature, or Ghosts and Ghost Seers, by Catherine Crow. Chapter 17. Miscellaneous Phenomena. In a former chapter, I alluded to the form seen floating over graves by Billing, Fethel's amanuensis. By some persons, this luminous form is seen only as a light, just as occurs in many of the apparition cases I have related. How far Baron Reichenbach is correct in his conclusion that these figures are merely the result of the chemical process going on below, it's impossible for anyone at present to say. The fact that these lights do not always hover over the graves, but sometimes move from them, militates against this opinion, as I have before observed, and the insubstantial nature of the form which reconstructed itself after Pfeffel had passed his stick through it, proves nothing, since the same thing is asserted of all apparitions I meet with, let them be seen where they may, except in such very extraordinary cases as that of the Bride of Corinth, supposing that story to be true. At the same time, although these cases are not made out to be chemical phenomena, neither are we entitled to class them under the head of what is commonly understood by the word ghost, whereby we comprehend a shadowy shape informed by an intelligent spirit. But there are some cases, a few of which I'll mention, that it seems extremely difficult to include under one category or the other. The late Lieutenant General Robertson of Lowers, who served during the whole of the American War, brought home with him, at its termination, a negro, who went by the name of Black Tom, and who continued in his service. The room appropriated to the use of this man, in the general's town residence, I speak of Edinburgh, was on the ground floor, and he was heard frequently to complain that he could not rest in it, for that every night the figure of a headless lady, with a child in her arms, rose out of the hearth and frightened him dreadfully. Of course nobody believed this story, and it was supposed to be the dream of intoxication, as Tom was not remarkable for sobriety. But, strange to say, when the old mansion was pulled down to build Gillespie Hospital, which stands on its site, there was found, under the hearthstone in their apartment, a box containing the body of a female from which the head had been severed, and beside her lay the remains of an infant wrapped in a pillowcase trimmed with lace. She appeared, poor lady to have been cut off in the blossom of her sins, for she was dressed, and her scissors were yet hanging by a ribbon to her side, and her thimble was also in the box, having apparently fallen from the shriveled finger. Now, whether we are to consider this a ghost, or phenomenon of the same nature as that seen by Billing, it is difficult to decide. Somewhat similar is the following case, which I have borrowed from a little work entitled Supernaturalism in New England. Not only does this little extract prove that the same phenomena, be they interpreted as they may, exist in all parts of the world, but I think it will be granted me that, although we have not here the confirmation that time furnished in the former instance, yet it is difficult to suppose that this unexcitable person should have been the subject of so extraordinary a spectral illusion. Whoever has seen Great Pond in the east parish of Haverhill, has seen one of the very loveliest of the thousand little lakes or ponds of New England. With its soft slopes of greenest verdure, its white and sparkly sand rim, its southern hem of pine and maple mirrored with spray and leaf in the glassy water, its graceful hill sentinels round about, white with the orchard bloom of spring or tasseled with the corn of autumn, its long sweep of blue waters broken here and there by picturesque headlands, it would seem a spot of all others where spirits of evil must shrink, rebuked and abashed from the presence of the beautiful. Yet here too has the shadow of the supernatural fallen. A lady of my acquaintance, a staid and imaginative church member, states that a few years ago she was standing in the angle formed by two roads, one of which traverses the pond shore, the other leading over the hill which rises abruptly from the water. It was a warm summer evening, just at sunset. She was startled by the appearance of a horse and cart, of the kind used a century ago in New England, driving rapidly down the steep hillside and crossing the wall a few yards before her, without noise or displacing of a stone. The driver sat sternly erect, with a fierce countenance, grasping the reins tightly, and looking neither to the right nor to the left. 
Behind the cart, and apparently lashed to it, was a woman of gigantic size, her countenance convulsed with a blended expression of rage and agony, writhing and struggling like Lukun in the folds of the serpent. Her head, neck, feet and arms were naked. Wild locks of grey hair streamed back from the temples, corrugated and darkened. The horrible cavalcade swept by across the street and disappeared at the margin of the pond. Many persons will have heard of the wild troop of Rodenstein, but few are aware of the curious amount of evidence there is in favour of the strange belief which prevails among the inhabitants of that region. The story goes that the former possessors of the castles of Rodenstein and Schnellert were robbers and pirates, who committed in conjunction all manner of enormities, and that, to this day, the troop, with their horses and carriages and dogs, are heard every now and then, wildly rushing along the road between the two castles. It sounds like a fairy tale, yet so much was it believed that up to the middle of the last century regular reports were made to the authorities in the neighborhood of the periods when the troop had passed. Since that, the Langerich, or court lead, has been removed to Firth, and they trouble themselves no longer about the Rodenstein troop. But a traveller named Wirth, who a few years ago undertook to examine into the affair, declares that the people assert that the passage of the visionary cavalcade still continues, and they assured him that certain houses that he saw lying in ruins were that in that state because, as they lay directly in the way of the troop, they were uninhabitable. There is seldom anything seen, but the noise of carriage wheels, horses' feet, smacking of whips, blowing of horns, and the voice of these fierce hunters of men urging them on, are the sounds by which they recognize that the troop is passing from one castle to the other, and at a spot which was formerly a blacksmith, but now is a carpenter's, the invisible lord of Rodenstein still stops to have his horse shod. Mr. Wyth copied several of the depositions out of the court records, and they are brought down to June, 1764. This is certainly a strange story, but it is not much more so than that of the black man, which I know to be true. During the Seven Years' War in Germany, a drover lost his life in a drunken squabble on the high road. For some time there was a sort of rude tombstone with a cross on it to mark the spot where his body was interred. But this has long fallen, and a milestone now fills its place. Nevertheless, it continues commonly asserted by the country people, and also by various travellers, that they have been deluded in that spot by seeing, as they imagine, herds of beasts, which on investigation proved to be merely visionary. Of course, many people look upon this as superstition, but a very singular confirmation of the story occurred in the year 1826, when two gentlemen and two ladies were passing the spot in a post-carriage. One of these was a clergyman, and none of them have ever heard of the phenomenon said to be attached to the place. They had been discussing the prospects of the minister, who was on his way to a vicarage, to which he had just been appointed, when they saw a large flock of sheep, which stretched quite across the road, and was accompanied by a shepherd and a long-haired black dog. As to meet cattle on that road was nothing uncommon, and indeed they had met several droves in the course of the day, no remark was made at the moment, till suddenly each looked at the other and said, What is become of the sheep? Quite perplexed at their sudden disappearance, they called to the postillion to stop, and all got out in order to mount a little elevation and look around, but still unable to discover them, they now bethought themselves of asking the postillion where they were, when, to their infinite surprise, they learned that he had not seen them. Upon this, they bade him quicken his pace, that they might overtake a carriage that had passed them shortly before, and inquire if that party had seen the sheep, but they had not. Four years later, a postmaster named J was on the same road, driving a carriage in which were a clergyman and his wife, when he saw a large flock of sheep near the same spot. Seeing they were very fine weathers, and supposing them to have been bought at a sheep fair that was then taking place a few miles off, Jay drew up his reins and stopped his horse, turning at the same time to the clergyman to say that he wanted to inquire the price of the sheep, as he intended going next day to the fair himself. While the minister was asking him what sheep he meant, Jay got down and found himself in the midst of the animals, the size and beauty of which astonished him. They passed him at an unusual rate, while he made his way through them to find the shepherd, when, on getting to the end of the flock, they suddenly disappeared. He then first learned that his fellow travellers had not seen them at all. 
Now, if such cases as these are not pure illusions, which I confess I find it difficult to believe, we must suppose that the animals and all the extraneous circumstances are produced by the magical will of the spirit, either acting on the constructed imagination of the seers, or else actually constructing the ethereal forms out of the elements at its command, just as we have supposed an apparition able to present himself with whatever dress or appliances he conceives. Or else we must conclude these forms to have some relation to the mystery called palignasia, which I have previously alluded to, although the motion and change of place render it difficult to bring them under this category. As for the animals, although the drover was lame, they were not, and therefore, even granting them to have souls, we cannot look upon them as the apparitions of the flock. Neither can we consider the numerous instances of armies seen in the air to be apparitions, and yet these phenomena are so well established that they have been accounted for by supposing them to be atmospherical reflections of armies elsewhere, in actual motion. But how are we to account for the visionary troops which are not seen in the air, but on the very ground on which the seers themselves stand, which was the case especially with those seen in Havre Park near Ripley in the year 1812? These soldiers wore a white uniform, and in the center was a personage in a scarlet one. After performing several revolutions, the body began to march in perfect order to the summit of a hill, passing the spectators at a distance of about one hundred yards. They amounted to several hundreds, and marched in a column, four deep, across about thirty acres. And no sooner were they passed, than another body, far more numerous, but dressed in dark clothes, arose and marched after them, without any apparent hostility. Both parties, having reached the top of the hill, and there formed what the spectators called an L, they disappeared down the other side, and were seen no more. But at that moment a volume of smoke arose like the discharge of a park of artillery, which was so thick that the men could not, for two or three minutes, discover their own cattle. They then hurried home to relate what they had seen, and the impression made on them is described as so great that they could never allude to the subject without emotion. One of them was a farmer of the name of Jackson, aged forty-five. The other was a lad of fifteen, called Turner, and they were at the time herding cattle in the park. The scene seems to have lasted nearly a quarter of an hour, during which time they were quite in possession of themselves, and able to make remarks to each other on what they saw. They were both men of excellent character and an impeccable veracity, and so much that nobody who knew them doubted that they actually saw what they described, or at all events believed that they did. It is so to be observed also that the ground is not swampy, nor subject to any exhalations. About the year 1750, a visionary army of the same description was seen in the neighborhood of Inverness by a respectable farmer of Glenary and his son. The number of troops was very great, and they had not the slightest doubt that they were otherwise than substantial forms of flesh and blood. They counted at least sixteen pairs of columns, and had abundance of time to observe every particular. The front ranks marched seven abreast, and were accompanied by a good many women and children who were carrying tin cans and other implements of cookery. The men were clothed in red, and their arms shone brightly in the sun. In the midst of them was an animal, a deer or a horse, they could not distinguish which, that they were driving furiously forward with their bayonets. The younger of the two men observed to the other that every now and then the rear ranks were obliged to run to overtake the van, and the elder one, who had been a soldier, remarked that that was always the case, and recommended him, if he ever served, to try and march in the front. There was only one mounted officer. He rode a grey dragoon horse, and wore a gold-laced hat and blue hussar cloak, with wide, open sleeves, lined with red. The two spectators observed him so particularly that they said afterward they should recognize him anywhere. They were, however, afraid of being ill-treated or forced to go along with the troops, whom they concluded had come from Ireland, and landed at Kintyre, and while they were climbing over a dike to get out of the way, the whole thing vanished. Some years since, a phenomenon of the same sort was observed at Paderborn in Westphalia, and seen by at least thirty persons, as well as by horses and dogs, as was discovered by the demeanor of these animals. In October 1836, on the very same spot, there was a review of twenty thousand men, and the people then concluded that the former vision was a second sight. A similar circumstance occurred in Stockton Forest some years ago, 
and there are many recorded elsewhere, one specially in the year 1686, near Lanark, where for several afternoons in the months of June and July there were seen by numerous spectators companies of men in arms marching in order by the banks of the Clyde, and other companies meeting them, added to which they were showers of bonnets, hats, guns, swords, etc., which the seers described with the greatest exactness. All who were present could not see these things, and Walker relates that one gentleman, particularly, was turning the thing into ridicule, calling the seers damned witches and warlocks with a second sight, boasting that the devil a thing he could see, when he suddenly exclaimed, with fear and trembling, that he now saw it all, and entreated those who did not see to say nothing, a change that may be easily accounted for, be the phenomenon of what nature it may, by supposing him to have touched one of the seers, when the faculty would be communicated like a shock of electricity. With regard to the palingnasia, it would be necessary to establish that these objects had previously existed, and that, as Otiger says, the earthly husk having fallen off, the volatile essence had ascended perfect in form, but void of substance. The notion supported by Baron Reichenbach, that the light seen in churchyards and over graves are the result of a process going on below, is by no means new, for Gaffarilus suggested the same opinion in 1650. Only he speaks of the appearances over graves and in churchyards as shadows, ombres, as they appeared to Billing, and he mentions casually a thing frequently observed, that the same visionary forms are remarked on the ground where battles have been fought, which he thinks arise out of a process between the earth and the sun. When a limb has been cut off, some sonambles still discern the form of the member as if actually attached. But this magical process is said to be not only the work of the elements, but also possible to man, as that as the forms of plants can be preserved after substance is destroyed, so can that of man be either preserved or reproduced from the elements of his body. In the reign of Louis XIV, three alchemists, having distilled some earth taken from the cemetery of the innocents in Paris, were forced to desist by seeing the forms of men appearing in their vials instead of the philosopher's stone which they were seeking. And the physician, who after dissecting a body and pulverizing the cranium, which was then an article admitted into the Materia Medica, had left the powder on the table of his laboratory in charge of his assistant. The latter, who slept in an adjoining room, was awakened in the night by hearing a noise, which after some search he ultimately traced to the powder, in the midst of which he beheld, gradually constructed itself, a human form. First appeared the head, with two open eyes, then the arms and hands, and by degrees the rest of the person, which subsequently assumed the clothes it had worn when alive. The man was, of course, frightened out of his wits, the rather as the apparition planted itself before the door and would not let him go away till it had made its own exit, which it speedily did. Similar results have been said to arise from experiments performed on blood. I confess I should be disposed to consider these apparitions, if ever they appeared, cases of genuine ghosts brought into rapport by the operation, rather than forms residing in the bones or blood. At all events, these things are very hard to believe, but seeing we were not there, I do not think we have any right to say they did not happen, or at least that some phenomena did not occur, that they were open to this interpretation. It is highly probable that the seeing of those visionary armies and similar prodigies is a sort of second sight, but having admitted this, we are very little nearer an explanation. Granting that, as in the above experiments, the essence of things may retain the forms of the substance, this does not explain the seeing that which has not yet taken place, or which is taking place at so great a distance that neither Oettinger's essence nor the superficial films of Lucretius can remove the difficulty. It is the fashion to say that second sight was a mere superstition of the Highlanders, and that no such thing is ever heard of now, but those who talk in this way know very little of the matter. No doubt, if they set out to look for seers, they may not find them, such phenomena, though known in all countries and in all ages, are comparatively rare, as well as uncertain and capricious, and not to be exercised at will. But I know of too many instances of the existence of this faculty in families, as well as of isolated cases occurring to individuals above all suspicion, to entertain the smallest doubt of its reality. But the difficulty of furnishing evidence is considerable. 
because when the seers are of the humble classes, they are called impostors and not believed, and when they are of the higher, they do not make the subject a matter of conversation, nor choose to expose themselves to the ridicule of the foolish, and consequently the thing is not known beyond their own immediate friends. When the young Duke of Orleans was killed, a lady residing here saw the accident and described it to her husband at the time it was occurring in France. She had frequently seen the Duke when on the continent. Captain N went to stay two days at the house of Lady T. After dinner, however, he announced that he was under the necessity of going away that night, nor could he be induced to remain. On being much pressed for an explanation, he confided to some of the party that, during the dinner, he had seen a female figure with her throat cut, standing behind Lady T's chair. Of course, it was thought an illusion, but Lady T was not told of it, lest she should be alarmed. That night, the household was called up for the purpose of summoning a surgeon. Lady T had cut her own throat. Mr. C, who though a Scotchman, was an entire skeptic with regard to the second sight, was told by a seer whom he had been jeering on the subject, that within a month he, Mr. C, would be a pallbearer at a funeral, that he would go by a certain road, but that, before they had crossed the brook, a man in a drab coat would come down the hill and take the pall from him. The funeral occurred, Mr. C was a bearer, and they went by the road described, but he firmly resolved that he would disappoint the seer by keeping the pole while they crossed the brook. But shortly before they reached it, the postman overtook them with letters, which in that part of the country arrived but twice a week, and Mr. C, who was engaged in some speculations of importance, turned to receive them, at which moment the pole was taken from him, and on looking round he saw it was by a man in a drab coat. A medical friend of mine, who practiced some time at Deptford, was once sent for to a girl who had been taken suddenly ill. He found her with inflammation of the brain, and the only account the mother could give of it was that, shortly before, she had run into the room crying, Oh, mother, I have seen Uncle John drown in his boat under the fifth arch of Rochester Bridge. The girl died a few hours afterward, and on the following night the uncle's boat ran foul of the bridge, and he was drowned, exactly as she had foretold. Mrs. A., an English lady and the wife of a clergyman, relates that, previous to her marriage, she with her father and mother being at the seaside, had arranged to make a few days' excursion to some races that were about to take place. And that the night before they started, the father having been left alone while the ladies were engaged with their preparations, they found him, on descending to the drawing-room, in a state of considerable agitation, which, he said, had arisen from his having seen a dreadful face at one corner of the room. He described it as a bruised, battered, crushed, discolored face, with the two eyes protruding frightfully from their sockets. But the features were too disfigured to ascertain if it were the face of anyone he knew. On the following day, on their way to the races, an accident occurred, and he was brought home with his own face exactly in the condition he had described. He had never exhibited any other instance of this extraordinary faculty, and the impression made by the circumstance lasted the remainder of his life, which was unhappily shortened by the injuries he had received. The late Mrs. V., a lady of fortune and family, who resides near Loch Lomond, possessed this faculty in an extraordinary degree, and displayed it on many remarkable occasions. When her brother was shipwrecked in the channel, she was heard to exclaim, "'Thank God he saved!' and described the scene with all its circumstances. Colonel David Stewart, a determined believer in what he calls the supernatural, in his book on the Highlanders, relates the following fact as one so remarkable that credulous minds may be excused for believing it to have been prophetic. He says that, late in an autumnal evening of the year 1773, the son of a neighbor came to his father's house, and soon after his arrival inquired for a little boy of the family, then about three years old. He was shown up to the nursery, and found the nurse putting a pair of new shoes on the child, which she complained did not fit. Never mind, said the young man, they will fit him before he wants them. A prediction which not only offended the nurse, but seemed at the moment absurd, since the child was apparently in perfect health. When he joined the party in the drawing-room, he being much jeered upon his new gift of second sight, 
explained that the impression he had received originated in his having just seen a funeral passing the wooden bridge which crossed the stream at a short distance from the house he first observed a crowd of people and on coming near he saw a person carrying a small coffin followed by about twenty gentlemen all of his acquaintance his own father and a mr stewart being among the number he did not attempt to join the procession which he saw turn off into the churchyard but knowing his own father could not be actually there and that mr and mrs stewart were then at blair he felt a conviction that the phenomenon portended the death of the child a persuasion which was verified by its suddenly expiring on the following night and colonel stewart adds that the circumstances and attendance at the funeral were precisely such as the young man had described he mentions also that this gentleman was not a seer that he was a man of education and general knowledge and that this was the first and only vision of the sort he had ever had i know of a young lady who has three times seen funerals in this way the old persuasion that fasting was a means of developing the spirit of prophecy is undoubtedly well founded and the annals of medicine furnish numerous facts which establish it a man condemned to death at viterbo having abstained from food in the hope of escaping execution became so clairvoyant that he could tell what was doing in any part of the prison the expression used in the report is that he saw through the walls this however could not be with his natural organs of sight it is worthy of observation that idiots often possess some glimpse of this faculty of second sight or presentiment and it's probably on this account that they are in some countries held sacred presentiment which i think may very probably be merely the vague and imperfect recollection of what we knew in our sleep is often observed in drunken people in the great plague at basel which occurred toward the end of the sixteenth century almost everybody who died called out in their last moments the name of the person that was to follow them next not long ago a servant girl on the state of d of s saw with amazement five figures ascending a perpendicular cliff quite inaccessible to human feet one was a boy wearing a cap with red binding she watched them with great curiosity till they reached the top where they all stretched themselves on the earth with countenances expressive of great dejection while she was looking at them they disappeared and she immediately related her vision shortly afterward a foreign ship in distress was seen to put off a boat with four men and a boy the boat was dashed to pieces in the surf and the five bodies exactly answering the description she had given were thrown on shore at the foot of the cliff which they had perhaps climbed in spirit how well what we call clairvoyance was known though how little understood at the period of the witch persecution is proved by what dr henry moore says in his antidote against atheism we will now pass to those supernatural effects which are observed in them they are bewitched or possessed and such as a foretelling things to come telling what such and such persons speak or do as exactly as if they were by them when the party possessed is at one end of the town and sitting in a house within doors and those parties that act and comfort together are without at the other end of the town to be able to see some and not others to play at cards with one certain person and not to discern anybody else at the table beside him to act and talk and go up and down and tell what will become of things and what happens in those fits of possession and then as soon as the possessed or bewitched party is out of them to remember nothing at all but to inquire concerning the welfare of those whose faces they seemed to look upon just before when they were in their fits a state which he believes to arise from the devils having taken possession of the body of the magnetic person which is precisely the theory supported by many fanatical persons in our own day dr moore was not a fanatic but this phenomena though very well understood by the ancient philosophers as well as by paracelsus van helmont cornelius agrippa jacob behmen a scotch physician called maxwell who published on the subject in the seventeenth century and many others were still when observed looked upon as the effects of diabolical influence by mankind in general when monsieur six deniers the artist was drowned in the scene in eighteen forty six after his body had been vainly sought a sonnambul was applied to in whose hands they placed a portfolio belonging to him and being asked where the owner was she evinced great terror held up her dress as if walking in the water and said that he was between two boats under the pont des arts with nothing on but a flannel waistcoat and there he was found 
a friend of mine knows a lady who early one morning being in a natural state of clairvoyance without magnetism saw the porter of the house where her son lodged ascend to his room with a carving knife go to his bed where he lay asleep lean over him then open a chest take out a fifty-pound note and retire on the following day she went to her son and asked him if he had any money in the house he said yes i have fifty pounds whereupon she bade him seek it but he was gone they stopped payment of the note but did not prosecute thinking the evidence insufficient subsequently the porter being taken up for other crimes the note was found crumpled up at the bottom of a note purse belonging to him dr anna moser says that there is no doubt of the ancient sibyls having been clairvoyant women and that it is impossible so much value could have been attached to their books had not their revelations been verified a maid servant residing in a family in northumberland one day last winter was heard to utter a violent scream immediately after she had left the kitchen on following her to inquire what had happened she said that she had just seen her father in his night clothes with a most horrible countenance and she was sure something dreadful had happened to him two days afterward there arrived a letter saying he had been seized with delirium tremens and was at the point of death which accordingly ensued there are innumerable cases of this sort recorded in various collections not to mention the much more numerous ones that meet with no recorder and i could myself mention many more but this will suffice one however i will not omit for though historical it's not generally known a year before the rebellion broke out in consequence of which lord kilmarnock lost his head the family were one day startled by a scream and on rushing out to inquire what had occurred they found the servants all assembled in amazement with the exception of one maid who they said had gone up to the garrets to hang some linen on the lines to dry on ascending tighter they found the girl on the floor in a state of insensibility and they had no sooner revived her than on seeing lord kilmarnock bending over her she screamed and fainted again when ultimately recovered she told them that while hanging up her linen and singing the door had burst open and his lordship's bloody head had rolled in i think it came twice this event was so well known at the time that on the first rumours of the rebellion lord Salton said kilmarnock would lose his head it was answered that kilmarnock had not joined the rebels he will and will be beheaded returned lord Salton. now in these cases we are almost compelled to believe that the phenomenon is purely subjective and there is no veritable outstanding object seen yet when we have taken refuge in this hypothesis the difficulty remains as great as ever and is to me much more incomprehensible than ghost seeing because in the latter we suppose an external agency acting in some way or other on the seer i have already mentioned that oberlin the good pastor of ben de la roche himself a ghost seer asserted that everything earthly had its counterpart or antitype in the other world not only organized but unorganized matter if so do we sometimes see these antitypes dr anna moser in treating of second sight which by the way is quite as well known in germany and especially in denmark as in the highlands of scotland says that as in natural somnambulism there is a partial internal vigilance so does the seer fall while awake into a dream state he suddenly becomes motionless and stiff his eyes are open and his senses are while the vision lasts unperceptive of all external objects the vision may be communicated by the touch and sometimes persons at a distance from each other but connected by blood or sympathy have the vision simultaneously he remarks also that as we have seen in the above case of mr c any attempt to frustrate the fulfilment of the vision never succeeds inasmuch as the attempt appears to be taken into the account the seeing in glass and in crystals is equally inexplicable as is the magical seeing of the egyptians every now and then we hear it said that this last is discovered to be an imposition because some traveller has either actually fallen into the hands of an impostor and there are impostors in all trades or because the phenomenon was imperfectly exhibited a circumstance which as these ambitions of clairvoyants and somnambulists where all the conditions are not under command or even recognized must necessarily happen but not to mention the accounts published by mr lane and lord prudhall whoever has read that of monsieur leon laborde must be satisfied that the thing is an indisputable fact it is in fact only another form of the seeing crystals which has been known in all ages 
and of which many modern instances have occurred among somnambulic patients we see by the forty-fourth chapter of genesis that it was by his cup that joseph prophesied is not this it in which my lord drinketh and whereby indeed he divineth but as dr passavant observes and as we shall presently see in the anecdote of the boy and the gypsy the virtue does not lie in the glass nor in the water but in the seer himself who may possess a more or less developed faculty the external objects and ceremonies being only the means of concentrating the attention and intensifying the power monsieur leon laborde witnessed the exhibition at cairo before lord p s visit the exhibitor named achmed appeared to him a respectable man who spoke simply of his science and had nothing of the charlatan about him the first child employed was a boy eleven years old the son of a european and achmed having traced some figures on the palm of his hand and poured ink over them bade him look for the reflection of his own face the child said he saw it the magician then burned some powders in a brazier and bade him tell him when he saw a soldier sweeping a place and while the fumes from the brazier diffused themselves he pronounced a sort of litany presently the child threw back his head and screaming with terror sobbed out while bathed in tears that he had seen a dreadful face fearing the boy might be injured monsieur laborde now caught up a little arab servant who had never seen or heard of the magician he was gay and laughing and not at all frightened and the ceremony being repeated he said he saw the soldier sweeping in the front of a tent he was then desired to bid the soldier bring shakespeare colonel craddock and several other persons and he described every person and thing so exactly as to be entirely satisfactory during the operations the boy looked as if intoxicated with his eyes fixed and the perspiration dripping from his brow achmed disenchanted him by placing his thumbs on his eyes he gradually recovered and gaily related all he had seen which he perfectly remembered now this is merely another form of what the laplanders the african magicians and the shamans of siberia do by taking narcotics and turning round till they fall down in a state of insensibility in which condition they are clear seers and besides vaticinating describe scenes places and persons they have never seen in barbary they anoint their hands with a black ointment and then holding them up in the sun they see whatever they desire like the egyptians lady s possesses somewhat of a singular faculty naturally by walking rapidly round the room several times till a certain degree of vertigo is produced she will name to you any person you have privately thought of or agreed upon with others her phrase is i see so and so monsieur laborde purchased the secret of achmed who said he had learned it from two celebrated sheiks of his own country which was augiers monsieur l found him connected with both physics and magnetism and practised it himself afterward with perfect success and he affirms positively that under the influence of a particular organization and certain ceremonies among which he cannot distinguish which are indispensable and which are not that a child without fraud or collusion can see as through a window or peephole people moving who appear and disappear at their command and with whom they hold communication and they remember everything after the operation he says i narrate but explain nothing i produce those effects but cannot comprehend them i only affirm in the most positive manner that what i relate is true i perform the experiment in various places with various subjects before numerous witnesses in my own room or other rooms in the open air and even in a boat on the nile the exactitude and detailed descriptions of persons places and scenes could by no possibility be feigned moreover baron Dapotet has very lately succeeded in obtaining this phenomenon in paris from persons not symbolic selected from his audience the chief difference being that they did not recollect what they had seen when the crisis was over cagliostro though a charlatan was possessed of his secret and it was his great success in it that chiefly sustained his reputation the spectators convinced he could make children see distant places and persons in glass were persuaded he could do other things which appeared to them no more mysterious dr d was perfectly honest with regard to his mirror in which he could see by concentrating his mind on it but as he could not remember what he saw he employed kelly to see for him while he himself wrote down the revelations and kelly was a rogue and deceived and ruined him a friend of pfeffel's knew a boy apprenticed to an apothecary at shop and wire who 
having been observed to amuse himself by looking into vials filled with water, was asked what he saw, when it was discovered that he possessed this faculty of seeing in glass, which was afterward very frequently exhibited for the satisfaction of the curious. Pfeffel also mentions another boy who had this faculty, and who went about the country with a small mirror, answering questions, recovering stolen goods, etc. He said that he one day fell in with some gypsies, one of whom was sitting apart and staring to his glass. The boy, from curiosity, looked over his shoulder and exclaimed that he saw a fine man who was moving about, whereupon the gypsy, having interrogated him, gave him the glass. For, said he, I have been staring it long enough and can see nothing but my own face. It is almost unnecessary to observe that the sacred books of the Jews and of the Indians testify to their acquaintance with this mode of divination, as well as many others. Many persons will have heard or read an account of Mr. Canning and Mr. Huskinson having seen, while in Paris, the visionary representation of their own deaths in water, as exhibited to them by a Russian or Polish lady there. As I do not, however, know what authority there is for this story, I will not insist on it here. But St. Simon relates a very curious circumstance of this nature, which occurred at Paris, and was related to him by the Duke of Orleans, after what regent. The latter said that he had sent on the preceding evening for a man, then in Paris, who pretended to exhibit whatever was desired in a glass of water. He came, and a child of seven years old, belonging to the house, being called up, they bade her tell what she saw doing in certain places. She did and as they sent to these places and found her report correct they bade her next describe under what circumstances the king would die without however asking when the death would take place the child knew none of the court and had never been at versailles yet she described everything exactly the room bed furniture and the king himself madame de maintenon fagon the physician the princes and princesses everybody in short including a child wearing an order in the arms of a lady whom she recognized as having seen this was madame de ventadour it was remarkable that she omitted the dukes de bourgogne and berry and monsieur and also the duchess de bourgogne orleans insisted they must be there describing them but she always said no these persons were then all well but they died before the king she also saw the children of the prince and princess of conti but not themselves which was correct as they also died shortly after this occurrence orleans then wished to see his own destiny and the man said if he would not be frightened he could show it to him as if painted on the wall and after fifteen minutes of conjuration the duke appeared of the natural size dressed as usual but with a couronne fermé or closed crown on his head which they could not comprehend as it was not that of any country they knew of it covered his head and only four circles and nothing at the top they had never seen such one when he became regent they understood that that was the interpretation of the prediction in connection with this subject the aversion to glass frequently manifested by dogs is well worthy of observation when facts of this kind are found to be recorded or believed in in all parts of the world from the beginning of it up to the present time it is surely vain for the so-called sevens to deny them and as cicero justly says in describing the different kinds of magic what we have to do with is the facts since of the cause we know little neither he adds are we to repudiate this phenomena because we sometimes find them imperfect or even false any more than we are to distrust that the human eye sees although some do this very imperfectly or not at all we are a part spirit and part matter by the former we are allied to the spiritual world and to the absolute spirit and as nobody doubts that the latter can work magically that is for by the mere act of will all things were created and by its constant exertion all things are sustained why should we be astonished that we who partake of the divine nature and were created after god's own image should also within certain limits partake of this magical power that this power has been frequently abused is the fault of those who being capable refuse to investigate and deny the existence of this and similar phenomena and by thus casting them out of the region of legitimate science leave them to become the prey of the ignorant and designing dr anemoser in his very learned work on magic shows us that all the phenomena of magnetism and somnambulism and all the various kinds of divination have been known and practised in every country under the sun and have been intimately connected with 
and indeed may be traced up to the fountainhead of every religion what are the limits of these powers possessed by us while in the flesh how far they may be developed and whether at the extreme verge of what we can affect we begin to be aided by god or by spirits of other spheres of existence bordering on ours we know not but with respect to the morality of these practices it suffices that what is good in act or intention must come of good and what is evil in act or intention must come of evil which is true now as it was in the time of moses and the prophets when miracles and magic were used for purposes holy and unholy and were to be judged accordingly god works by natural laws of which we yet know very little and in some departments of his kingdom nothing and whatever appears to us supernatural only appears so from our ignorance and whatever faculties or powers he has endowed us with it must have been designed we should exercise and cultivate for the benefit and advancement of our race nor can i for one moment suppose that though like everything else liable to abuse the legitimate exercise of these powers if we knew their range would be useless much less pernicious or sinful of the magical power of will as i have said before we know nothing and it does not belong to a purely rationalistic age to acknowledge what it cannot understand in all countries men have arisen here and there who have known it and some traces of it have survived both in language and in popular superstitions if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed you shall say unto this mountain remove hence and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible to you how bait this kind goeth not out by prayer and fasting and voyez et croyez will and believe was the solution puisegur gave of his magical cures and no doubt the explanation of those affected by royal hands is to be found in the fact that they believed in themselves and having faith they could exercise will but with the belief in the divine right of kings the faith and the power would naturally expire together with respect to what christ says in the above quoted passage of fasting numerous instances are extant proving that clear seeing and other magical or spiritual powers are sometimes developed by it william cross a doctor of philosophy and a lecturer at jena who died during the prevalence of the cholera cultivated these powers and preached them i have not been able to obtain his works they being suppressed as far as it's practicable by the prussian government cross could leave his body and to all appearance die whenever he pleased one of his disciples yet living count von aberstein possesses the same faculty many writers of the sixteenth century were well acquainted with the power of will and to this was attributed the good or evil influence of blessings and curses they believed it to be of great effect in curing diseases and that by it alone life might be extinguished that subjectively life may be extinguished we have seen by the cases of colonel townshend the dervish that was buried hermotinus and others for doubtless the power that could perform so much could under an adequate motive have performed more and since all things in nature spiritual and material are connected and that there is an unceasing interaction between them we being members of one great whole only individualized by our organisms it is possible to conceive that the power which can be exerted on our own organism might be extended to others and since we cannot conceive man to be an isolated being the only intelligence besides god none above us and none below but must on the contrary believe that there are numerous grades of intelligences it seems to follow of course that we must stand in some kind of relation to them more or less intimate nor is it at all surprising that with some individuals this relation should be more intimate than with others finally we are not entitled to deny the existence of this magical or spiritual power as exerted by either incorporated or unincorporated spirits because we do not comprehend how it can be exerted since in spite of all the words that have been expanded on the subject we are equally ignorant of the mode in which our own will acts upon our own muscles we know the fact but not the mode of it end of chapter seventeen recording by liana leitch Section twenty seven of the Night Side of Nature or Ghosts and Ghost Seers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Night Side of Nature, or Ghosts and Ghost Seers, by Catherine Crow. Chapter 18. Conclusion. Of the power of the mind over matter we have a remarkable example in the numerous well-authenticated instances of the stigmata. As in most cases this phenomenon has been connected with a state of religious exaltation, and has been appropriated by the Roman Church as a miracle, the fact has been in this country pretty generally discredited, but without reason. In the Moser, Pazavent, Schubert, and other eminent German physiologists assure us that not only is the fact perfectly established, as regards many of the so-called saints, but also that there have been indubitable modern instances, as in the case of the Ecstaticus of the Tyrol, Catherine Emmerich, commonly called the Nun of Dolmen, Maria Morel, and Domenica Lazari, who have all exhibited the stigmata. Catherine Emmerich, the most remarkable of the three, began very early to have visions and to display unusual endowments. She was very pious, could distinguish the qualities of plants, reveal secrets or distant circumstances, and new people's thoughts, but was, however, extremely sickly and exhibited a variety of extraordinary and distressing symptoms which terminated in her death. The wounds of the crown of thorns round her head and those of the nails in her hands and feet were as perfect as if painted by an artist, and they bled regularly on Fridays. There was also a double cross on her breast. When the blood was wiped away the marks looked like the puncture of flies. She seldom took any nourishment but water, and having been but a poor cowkeeper, she discoursed when in the ecstatic state as if inspired. I am well aware that on reading this many persons who never saw her will say it was all imposture. It is very easy to say this, but it is as absurd as presumptuous to pronounce on what they have no opportunity of observing. I never saw these women either, but I find myself much more disposed to accept the evidence of those who did than of those who only do not believe because they do not believe. Neither Catherine Emmerich nor the others made their sufferings a source of profit nor had they any desire to be exhibited, but quite the contrary. She could see in the dark as well as the light, and frequently worked all night at making clothes for the poor without lamp or candle. There have been instances of magnetic patients being stigmatized in this matter. Madame B. von N. dreamed one night that a person offered her a red and white rose, and that she chose the latter. On awakening she felt a burning pain in her arm, and by degrees there arose there the figure of a rose, perfect in form and color. It was rather raised above the skin. The mark increased in intensity till the eighth day, after which it faded away, and by the fourteenth was no longer perceptible. A letter from Moscow addressed to Dr. Kerner in consequence of reading the account of the nun of Dolman relates a still more extraordinary case. At the time of the French invasion, a Cossack, having pursued a Frenchman into a cul-de-sac, an alley without an outlet, there ensued a terrible conflict between them in which the latter was severely wounded. A person who had taken refuge in this close and could not get away was so dreadfully frightened that when he reached home there broke out on his body the very same wounds that the Cossack had inflicted on his enemy. The signatures of the fetus are analogous facts, and if the mind of the mother can thus act on another organism, why not the minds of the saints or of Catherine Emmerich on their own? From the influence of the mother on the child we have but one step to that asserted to be possible between two organisms not visibly connected. For the difficulty therein lies that we do not see the link that connects them, though doubtless it exists. Dr. Blacklock, who lost his eyesight at an early period, said that when awake he distinguished persons by hearing and feeling them, but when asleep he had a distinct impression of another sense. He then seemed to himself united to them by a kind of distant contact, which was affected by threads passing from their bodies to his, which seems to be but a metaphorical expression of the fact. For whether the connection be maintained by an all-pervading either, or be purely dynamic, that the interaction exists between both organic and inorganic bodies is made evident wherever there is sufficient excitability to render the effect sensible. Till very lately the powers of the divining rod were considered a mere fable. Yet that this power exists, though not in the rod, but in the person that holds it, is now perfectly well established. Count Tristan, who has written a book on the subject, says that about one in forty have it, 
and that a complete course of experiments has proved the phenomenon to be electric. The rod seems to serve in some degree the same purpose as the magical mirror in conjurations, and it is also serviceable in presenting a result visible to the eye of the spectator. But numerous cases are met with in which metals or water are perceived beneath the surface of the earth without the intervention of the rod. A man called Bletton from Dauphiny possessed this divining power in a remarkable degree, as did a Swiss girl called Catherine Butler. She was strong and healthy and of a phlegmatic temperament, yet so susceptible of these influences that without the rod she pointed out and traced the course of water, veins of metal, coal beds, salt mines, etc. The sensations produced were sometimes on the soles of her feet, sometimes on her tongue or in her stomach. She never lost the power wholly, but it varied considerably in intensity at different times, as it did with Bletton. She was also rendered sensible of the bodily pains of others by laying her hand on the affected part or near it, and she performed several magnetic cures. A person now alive named Assange in the Macons possessed this power. He is a simple, honest man who can give no account of his own faculty. The abbeys Chalard and Paramel can also discover subterraneous springs, but they say it is effected by means of their geological science. M. D. of Cluny, however, found the faculty of Dussange much more to be relied on. The Greeks and Romans made hydroscopy an art, and there are works alluded to as having existed on this subject, especially one by Marcellus. The Caduceus of Mercury the wand of Circe and the wands of the Egyptian sorcerers show that the wand or rod was always looked upon as a symbol of divination. One of the most remarkable instances of the use of the divining rod is that of Jacques Imar. On the 5th of July, 1692, a man and his wife were murdered in a cellar at Lyon, and their house was robbed. Having no clue whatever to the criminal, this peasant, who had the reputation of being able to discover murderers, thieves, and stolen articles by means of the divining rod, was sent for from Dauphiny. Imar undertook to follow the footsteps of the assassins, but he said he must first be taken into the cellar where the murder was committed. The procurator royal conducted him thither, and they gave him a rod out of the first wood that came to hand. He walked about the cellar, but the rod did not move till he came to the spot where the man had been killed. Then Imar became agitated, and his pulse beat as if he were in a high fever and all these symptoms were augmented when he approached the spot on which they had found the body of the woman. From this, he of his own accord went into a sort of shop where the robbery had been committed. Thence he proceeded into the street, tracing the assassin step by step, first to the court of the archbishop's palace, then out of the city and along the right side of the river. He was escorted all the way by three persons appointed for the purpose who all testified that sometimes he detected the traces of three accomplices, sometimes only of two. He led the way to the house of a gardener where he insisted that they had touched a table and one of three bottles that were yet standing upon it. It was at first denied, but two children of nine or ten years old said that three men had been there and had been served with wine in that bottle. Imar then traced them to the river where they had embarked in a boat and what is very extraordinary, he tracked them as surely on the water as on the land. He followed them wherever they had gone ashore, went straight to the places they had lodged at, pointed out their beds and the very utensils of every description that they had used. On arriving at Sablon, where some troops were encamped, the rod and his own sensations satisfied him that the assassins were there. But fearing the soldiers would ill-treat him, he refused to pursue the enterprise further and returned to Lyon. He was, however, promised protection and sent back by water with letters of recommendation. On reaching Sablon, he said they were no longer there, but he tracked them into the Languedoc, entering every house they had stopped at till he at length reached the gates of the prison, and in the town of Beaucaire where he said one of them would be found. They brought all the prisoners before him, amounting to fifteen, and the only one his rod turned on was a little bossu, or deformed man, who had just been brought in for a petty theft. He then ascertained that the two others had taken the road to Nimes, and offered to follow them, but as the man denied all knowledge of the murder and declared he had never been at Lyon, it was thought best that they should return there, and as they went the way they had come and stopped at the same houses where he was recognized, he at length confessed that he had traveled with two men who had engaged him to assist in the crime. What is very remarkable, it was found necessary that Jacques Imar should walk in front of the criminal, for when he followed him he became violently sick. 
from Lyon to Beaucaire is forty-five miles. As the confession of the Basu confirmed all Imar had asserted, the affair now created an immense sensation, and a great variety of experiments were instituted, every one of which proved perfectly satisfactory. Moreover, two gentlemen, one of them the controller of the customs, were discovered to possess this faculty, though in a minor degree. They now took Imar back to Beaucaire that he might trace the other two criminals, and he went straight again to the prison gate, where he said that now another would be found. On inquiry, however, it was discovered that a man had been there to inquire for the Basu, but was gone again. He then followed them to Toulon, and finally to the frontier of Spain, which set a limit to further researches. He was often so faint and overcome with the effluvia, or whatever it was, that guided him, that the perspiration streamed from his brow, and they were obliged to sprinkle him with water to prevent his fainting. He detected many robberies in the same way. His rod moved whenever he passed over metals or water or stolen goods, but he found that he could distinguish the track of a murderer from all the rest by the horror and pain he felt. He made this discovery accidentally as he was searching for water. They dug up the ground and found the body of a woman that had been strangled. I have myself met with three or four persons in whose hands the rod turned visibly, and there are numerous very remarkable cases recorded in different works. In the hearts, there is a race of people who support themselves entirely by this sort of divination, and as they are paid very highly and do nothing else, they are generally extremely worthless and dissipated. The extraordinary susceptibility to atmospheric changes in certain organisms, and the faculty by which a dog tracks the foot of his master are analogous facts to those of the divining rod. Mr. Boyle mentions a lady who always perceived if a person that visited her came from a place where snow had lately fallen. I have seen one who, if a quantity of gloves are given her, can tell to a certainty to whom each belongs, and a particular friend of my own, on entering a room, can distinguish perfectly who has been sitting in it, provided these be persons he is familiarly acquainted with. Numerous extraordinary stories are extant respecting this kind of faculty in dogs. Doubtless not only our bodies but all matter sheds its atmosphere around it. The sterility of the ground where metals are found is notorious and it is asserted that to some persons the vapors that emanate from below are visible, and that as the height of the mountains round a lake furnishes a measure of its depth, so does the height to which these vapors ascend show how far below the surface the mineral treasures or waters lie. The effect of metals on some nambulic persons is well known to all who have paid any attention to these subjects, and surely may be admitted when it is remembered that Humboldt has discovered the same sensibility in zoophytes, where no traces of nerves could be detected, and many years ago Frascatorius asserted that symptoms resembling apoplexy were sometimes induced by the proximity of a large quantity of metal. A gentleman is mentioned who could not enter the men at Paris without fainting. In short, so many well-attested cases of idiosyncratic sensibilities exist that we have no right to reject others because they appear incomprehensible. Now we may not only easily conceive, but we know it to be a fact that fear, grief, and other detrimental passions vitiate the secretions. Footnote. In the medical annals a case is recorded of a young lady whose axillary excretions were rendered so offensive by the fright and horror she had experienced in seeing some of her relations assassinated in India that she was unable to go into society. End footnote. And augment transpiration and it is quite natural to suppose that where a crime has been committed which necessarily aroused a number of turbulent emotions exhalations perceptible to a very acute sense may for some time hover over the spot while the anxiety the terror the haste in short the general commotion of system that must accompany a murderer in his flight is quite sufficient to account for his path being recognizable by such an abnormal faculty for the wicked flee when no man pursueth we also know that a person perspiring with open pores is more susceptible than another to contagion, and we have only to suppose the pores of Jacques Imar so constituted as easily to imbibe the emanation shed by the fugitive, and we see why he should be affected by the disagreeable sensations he describes. The disturbing effect of odors on some persons which are quite innoxious to others must have been observed by everybody some people do actually almost die of a rose in aromatic pain boyle says that in his time many physicians avoided giving drugs to children 
having found that external applications to be imbibed by the skin or by respiration were sufficient, and the homeopaths occasionally use the same means now. Sir Charles Bell told me that Mr. F., a gentleman well known in public life, had only to hold an old book to his nose to produce all the effects of a cathartic. Elizabeth Oakey was oppressed with most painful sensations when near a person whose frame was sinking. Whenever this effect was of a certain intensity, Dr. Elliotson observed that the patient invariably died. Herein lies the secret of amulets and talismans which grew to be a vain superstition, but in which, as in all popular beliefs, there was a germ of truth. Somnambulic persons frequently prescribe them, and absurd as it may seem to many, there are instances in which their efficacy has been perfectly established, be the interpretation of the mystery what it may. In a great plague which occurred in Moravia, a physician who was constantly among the sufferers attributed the complete immunity of himself and his family to their wearing amulets composed of the powder of toads, which, says Boyle, caused an emanation adverse to the contagion. A Dutch physician mentions that in the plague at Nimegen, the pest seldom attacked any house till they had used soap in washing their linen. Wherever this was done, it appeared immediately. In short, we are the subjects, and so is everything around us, of all manner of subtle and inexplicable influences. And if our ancestors attached too much importance to these ill-understood arcana of the night side of nature, we have attached too little. The sympathetic effects of multitudes upon each other, of the young sleeping with the old, of magnetism on plants and animals are now acknowledged facts. May not many other asserted phenomena that we yet laugh at be facts also, though probably too capricious in their nature, by which I mean depending on laws beyond our apprehension, to be very available. For I take it that as there is no such thing as chance, but all would be certainty if we knew the whole of the conditions, so no phenomena are really capricious and uncertain. They only appear so to our ignorance and short-sightedness. The strong belief that formerly prevailed in the efficacy of sympathetic cures can scarcely have existed, I think, without some foundation. Nor are they a whit more extraordinary than the sympathetic falling of pictures and stopping of clocks and watches, of which such numerous well-attested cases are extant, that several learned German physiologists of the present day pronounce the thing indisputable. I have myself heard of some very perplexing instances. Gaffarillus alludes to a certain sort of magnet, not resembling iron, but of a black and white color, with which if a needle or knife were rubbed, the body might be punctured or cut without pain. How can we know that this is not true? Jugglers who slashed and cauterized their bodies for the amusement of the public were supposed to avail themselves of such secrets. How is it possible for us either to imagine that the numerous recorded cases of the blood ordeal, which consisted in the suspected assassin touching the body of his victim, can have been either pure fictions or coincidences? Not very long ago an experiment of a frightful nature is said to have been tried in France on a somnambulic person by placing on the epigastric region a vial filled with the arterial blood of a criminal just guillotined. The effect asserted to have been produced was the establishment of a rapport between the somnambule and the deceased which endangered the life of the former. Franz von Bader suggests the hypothesis of a vis sanguinis ultramortem, and supposes that a rapport or communio vitae may be established between the murderer and his victim, and he conceives the idea of this mutual relation to be the true interpretation of the sacrificial rites common to all countries, as also of the blutschuld or the requiring blood for blood. With regard to the blood ordeal, the following are two latest instances of it recorded to have taken place in this country. They are extracted from Hargrave State Trials. Evidence having been given with respect to the death of Jane Norcott, an ancient and grave person, minister of the parish in Herefordshire, where the murder took place, being sworn, deposed that the body being taken up out of the grave and the four defendants being present, were required each of them to touch the dead body. Oakman's wife fell upon her knees and prayed God to show her token of her innocency. The appellant did touch the body, whereupon the brow of the deceased, which was before of a livid and carrion color, began to have a dew or gentle sweat on it, which increased by degrees till the sweat ran down in drops on the face. The brow turned to a lively and fresh color, and the deceased opened one of her eyes and shut it again. 
In this opening the eye was done three several times. She likewise thrust out the ring or marriage finger three times, and pulled it in again, and blood dropped from the finger on the grass. Sir Nicholas hide the Chief Justice, seeming to doubt this evidence. He asked the witness, Who saw these things besides him? To which he, the witness, answered, My lord, I cannot swear what others saw, but I do believe the whole company saw it, and if it had been thought a doubt, proof would have been made, and many would have attested with me. My lord, added the witness, observing the surprise his evidence awakened, I am minister of the parish, and have long known all the parties, but never had the displeasure against any of them, nor they with me, but as I was minister. The thing was wonderful to me, but I have not interest in the matter, except as called on to testify to the truth. My lord, my brother, who is minister of the next parish, is here present, and I am sure saw all that I have affirmed. Hereupon, the brother being sworn, he confirmed the above evidence in every particular, and the first witness added that having dipped his finger into what appeared to be blood, he felt satisfied that it was really so. It is to be observed that this extraordinary circumstance must have occurred, if it occurred at all, when the body had been upward of a month dead, for it was taken up in consequence of various rumors implicating the prisoners, after the coroner's jury had given in a verdict of fellow de se. On their first trial they were acquitted, but an appeal being brought they were found guilty and executed. It was on this latter occasion that the above strange evidence was given which being taken down at the time by Sir John Maynard, then sergeant-at-law, stands recorded, as I have observed, in Hargrave's edition of State Trials. The above circumstances occurred in the year 1628, and in 1688 the blood ordeal was again had recourse to in the trial of Sir Philip Stansfield for parricide, on which occasion the body had also been buried, but for a short time. Certain suspicions arising, it was disinterred and examined by the surgeons, and from a variety of indications no doubt remained that the old man had been murdered, nor that his son was guilty of his death. When the body had been washed and arrayed in clean linen, the nearest relations and friends were desired to lift it and replace it in the coffin, and when Sir Philip placed his hand under it, he suddenly drew it back, stained with blood, exclaiming, Oh, God! And letting the body fall, he cried, Lord, have mercy on me, and went and bowed himself over a seat in the church in which the corpse had been inspected. Repeated testimonies are given to this circumstance in the course of the trial, and it is very remarkable that Sir John Dalrymple, a man of strong intellect and wholly free from superstition, admits it as an established fact in his charge to the jury. In short, we are all, though in different degrees, the subjects of a variety of subtle influences which more or less neutralize each other, and many of which, therefore, we never observe. And frequently, when we do observe the effects, we have neither time nor capacity for tracing the cause. And when in more susceptible organisms such effects are manifested, we content ourselves with referring to the phenomena to disease or imposture. The exemption or the power whichever it may be by which certain persons or races are enabled to handle venomous animals with impunity, is a subject that deserves much more attention than it has met with. But nobody thinks of investigating secrets that seem rather curious than profitable. Besides which, to believe these things implies a reflection on one's sagacity. Yet every now and then I hear a fact so extraordinary which come to me from undoubted authority, that I can see no reason in the world for rejecting others that are not much more so. For example, only the other day Mr. B. C., a gentleman well known in Scotland who has lived a great deal abroad, informed me that having frequently heard of the singular phenomenon to be observed by placing a scorpion and a mouse together under a glass, he at length tried the experiment, and the result perfectly established what he had been previously unable to believe. Both animals were evidently frightened. But the scorpion made the first attack and stung the mouse which defended itself bravely and killed the scorpion. The victory, however, was not without its penalties, for the mouse swelled to an unnatural size and seemed in danger of dying from the poison of its defeated antagonist, when it relieved itself and was cured by eating the scorpion, which was thus proved to be an anecdote to its own venom, furnishing a most interesting and remarkable instance of isopathy. There is a religious sect in Africa not far from Algiers who eat the most venomous serpents alive, and certainly it is said without extracting their fangs. 
They declare they enjoy the privilege from their founder. The creatures writhe and struggle between their teeth. But possibly if they do bite them, the bite is innocuous. Then, not to mention the common expedients of extracting the poisonous fangs or forcing the animal by repeated bitings to exhaust their venom, the fact seems too well established to be longer doubted that there are persons in whom the faculty of charming, or, in other words, disarming serpents, is inherent, as the Scylli and Marsi of old, and the people mentioned by Bruce, Hasequist, and Lempriere, who were themselves eyewitnesses of the facts they relate. With respect to the Marsi, it must be remembered that Heliogabalus made their priests fling venomous serpents into the circus when it was full of people, and that many perished by the bites of these animals, which the Marsi had handled with impunity. The modern charmers told Bruce that their immunity was born with them, and it was established beyond a doubt during the French expedition into Egypt that these people go from house to house to destroy serpents, as men do rats in this country. They declare that some mysterious instinct guides them to the animals, which they immediately seize with fury and tear to pieces with their hands and teeth. The negroes of the Antilles can smell a serpent which they do not see, and of whose presence a European is quite insensible. And Madame Calderon de la Barca mentions in her letters from Mexico some singular cases of exemption from the pernicious effects of venomous bites, and further relates that in some parts of America, where rattlesnakes are extremely abundant, they have a custom of inoculating children with the poison, and that this is a preservative from future injury. This may or may not be true, but it is so much the fashion in these days to set down to the account of fable everything deviating from our daily experience, that travellers may repeat these stories for ages before any competent person will take the trouble of verifying the report. However, taking the evidence altogether, it appears clear that there does exist in some persons a faculty of producing in these animals a sort of numbness, or engordisement, which renders them for the time incapable of mischief though of the nature of the power we are utterly ignorant unless it be magnetic. The senses of animals, although generally resembling ours, are yet extremely different in various instances, and we know that many of them have one faculty or another exalted to an intensity of which we have no precise conception. Galen asserted on the authority of the Marsi and Scylli themselves that they obtained their immunity by feeding on the flesh of venomous animals. But Pliny, Elian, Silius Italicus, and others account for the privilege by attributing it to the use of some substance of a powerful nature, with which they rubbed their bodies, and most modern travellers incline to the same explanation. But if this were the elucidation of the mystery, I suspect it would be easily detected. It is observable that in all countries where a secret of this sort exists, there is always found some custom which may be looked upon as either the cause or the consequence of the discovery. In Hindustan, for example, in order to test the truth of an accusation, the cobra capello is flung into a deep pot of earth with a ring, and if the supposed criminal succeeds in extracting the ring without being bitten by the serpent, he is accounted innocent. So the sacred asps in Egypt inflicted death upon the wicked, but spared the good. Dr. Allnut mentions that he saw a negro in Africa touch the protruded tongue of a snake with the black matter from the end of his pipe, which he said was tobacco oil. The effects were as rapid as a shock of electricity. The animal never stirred again, but stiffened and was as rigid and hard as if it had been dried in the sun. It is related of Makamut, a Moorish king, that he fed on poisons till his bite became fatal and his saliva venomous. Chelius Rodiginus mentions the same thing of a woman who was thus mortal to all her lovers. And Avicenna mentions a man whose bite was fatal in the same way. The boy that was found in the forest of Arden in 1563 and who had been nourished by a she-wolf made a great deal of money for a short time after he was introduced to civilized life by exempting the flocks and herds of the shepherds from the peril they nightly ran of being devoured by wolves. This he did by stroking them with his hands or wetting them with his saliva, after which they for some time enjoyed an immunity. His faculty was discovered from the circumstance of the beasts he kept never being attacked. It left him, however, when he was about fourteen, and the wolves ceased to distinguish him from other human beings. However, my readers will, I think, ere now have supped full with wonders, if not with horrors, and it is time I should bring this book to a conclusion. If I have done no more, I trust I shall at least have afforded some amusement. 
but i shall be better pleased to learn that i have induced any one if it be but one to look upon life and death and the mysteries that attach to both with a more curious and inquiring eye than they have hitherto done i cannot but think that it would be a great step if mankind could familiarize themselves with the idea that they are spirits incorporated for a time in the flesh but that the dissolution of the connection between soul and body though it changes the external conditions of the former leaves its mortal state unaltered what a man has made himself he will be his state is the result of his past life and his heaven or hell is in himself at death we enter upon a new course of life and what that life shall be depends upon ourselves if we have provided oil for our lamps and fitted ourselves for a noble destiny in the fellowship of the great and good spirits that have passed away such will be our portion and if we have misused our talent and sunk our souls in the sensual pleasures or base passions of this world we shall carry our desires and passions with us to make our torment in the other or perhaps be tethered to the earth by some inextinguishable remorse or disappointed scheme like those unhappy spirits i have been writing about and that perhaps for hundreds of years for although they be evidently freed from many of the laws of space and matter while unable to leave the earth they are still the children of time and have not entered into eternity it is surely absurd to expect that because our bodies have decayed and fallen away or been destroyed by an accident that a miracle is to be wrought in our favor and that the miser's love of gold or the profligate's love of vice is to be immediately extinguished and be superseded by inclinations and tastes better suited to his new condition new circumstances do not so rapidly engender a new mind here that we should hope they will do so there more especially as in the first place we do not know what facilities of improvement may remain in us and in the second since the law that seeks like must be undeviating the blind will seek the blind and not those who could help them to light i think too that if people would learn to remember that they are spirits and acquire the habit of conceiving of themselves as individuals apart from the body that they would not only be better able to realize this view of a future life but they would also find it much less difficult to imagine that since they belong to the spiritual world on the one hand quite as much as they belong to the material world on the other that these extraordinary faculties which they occasionally see manifested by certain individuals or in certain states may possibly be but faint rays of those properties which are inherent in spirit though temporarily obscured by its connection with the flesh and designed to be so for the purposes of this earthly existence the most ancient nations of the world knew this although we have lost sight of it as we learn by the sacred books of the hebrews according to the kabbalah mankind are endowed by nature not only with the faculty of penetrating into the regions of the supersensuous and invisible but also of working magically above and below or in the worlds of light and darkness as the eternal fills the world sees and is not seen so does the soul nictomic fill the body and sees without being seen the soul perceives that which the bodily eye cannot sometimes a man is seized suddenly with a fear for which he cannot account which is because the soul decries an impending misfortune the soul possesses also the power of working with the elementary matter of the earth so as to annihilate one form and produce another even by the force of imagination human beings can injure other things yea even to the slaying of a man the new platonist paracelsus says the same thing the Kabbalah teaches that there have in all times existed men endowed with powers in a greater or less degree to work good or evil, for to be a virtuoso in either requires a peculiar spiritual vigor. Thence, such men as heroes and priests in the kingdom of Tuma, the kingdom of the clean and unclean. If a man therefore sets his desires on what is godly in proportion as his efforts are not selfish, but purely a seeking of holiness, he will be endowed by the free grace of God with supernatural faculties. And it is the highest aim of existence that man should regain his connection with his inward original source and exalt the material and earthly into the spiritual. The highest degree of this condition of light and spirit is commonly called the holy ecstasy, which is apparently the degree attained by the ecstatics of the Tyrol. I am very far from meaning to imply that it is our duty, or in any way desirable, that we should seek to bring ourselves into this state of holy ecstasy, which seems to involve some derangement of the normal relations between the soul and body. 
but it is at least equally unwise in us to laugh at or deny it or its proximate conditions where they really exist it appears perfectly clear that as by giving ourselves up wholly to our external and sensuous life we dim and obscure the spirit of god that is in us so by annihilating as far as in us lies the necessities of the body we may so far subdue the flesh as to loosen the bonds of the spirit and enable it to manifest some of its inherent endowments ascetics and saints have frequently done this voluntarily and disease or a peculiar constitution sometimes does this for us involuntarily and it is far from desirable that we should seek to produce such a state by either means but it is extremely desirable that we should avail ourselves of the instruction to be gained by the simple knowledge that such phenomena have existed and been observed in all ages and that thereby our connection with the spiritual world may become a demonstrated fact to all who choose to open their eyes to it with regard to the cases of apparitions i have adduced they are not as i said before one hundredth part of those i could have brought forward had i resorted to a few of the numerous printed collections that exist in all languages whether the view i acknowledged myself to take of the facts be or not the correct one whether we are to look to the region of the psychical or the hyperphysical for the explanation the facts themselves are certainly well worthy of observation the more so as it will be seen that although ghosts are often said to be out of fashion such occurrences are in reality as rife as ever while if these shadowy forms be actually visitors from the dead i think we could not too soon lend an attentive ear to the tale their reappearance tells us that we do not all see them or that those who promise to come do not all keep tryst amounts to nothing we do not know why they can come nor why they cannot and as for not seeing them i repeat we must not forget how many other things there are that we do not see and since in science we know that there are delicate manifestations which can only be rendered perceptible to our organs by the application of the most delicate electrometers is it not reasonable to suppose that there may exist certain susceptible or diseased organisms which judiciously handled may serve as electrometers to the healthy ones as my book is designed as an inquiry with a note of interrogation i characteristically bid adieu to my readers c c end of section twenty seven recording by philip gould end of the night side of nature or ghosts and ghost 